Hi, uh, welcome to my assignment, uh, my lecture on assignment four. Uh, I, uh, this time, I think I'm going to try to give you a complete lecture all in one go. Once again, don't feel like you have to sit through the whole thing. You might want to take some breaks uh, through the course of it. But I, uh, but I, I, I am going to. My, my plan here is to say everything I want to say about uh, assignment number four, which is uh, books one and two of uh, Rousseau's discourse on inequality. Uh, let me uh, say a little bit about Rousseau. Well, one thing I'll just uh, admit is Rousseau's uh, just about my favorite philosopher. Uh, that's different from my, uh, the idea of my favorite person. Uh, I won't say much about it here, but uh, he, he was kind of a tough person if you read uh, uh, about his, uh, his biography. But his ideas, uh, to my mind, are really uh, intriguing and uh, deeply insightful. Uh, many, uh, and, and I'm not alone in that opinion, uh, many philosophers acknowledge a great debt to Rousseau. Uh, you know, Kant, Hegel, Marx, uh, Emile Durkheim, and John Rawls, uh, all towering figures in philosophy and related disciplines, uh, acknowledge their uh, debt uh, to Rousseau. Um, let me just say a little bit about uh, who Rousseau was, sort of locate him in time and place. Uh, he lived under Louis the Fifteenth uh, in the 18th century. Uh, he uh, he lived from about 1712, well, from 1712 to 1778. Uh, he was born in Geneva, but he spent his, uh, his adult life in France, uh, mostly uh, Paris. Uh, by all accounts, he was a prodigious genius. He was a composer, a novelist, and a philosopher who wrote, uh, you know, landmark works in uh, in philosophy. Um, I, one thing uh, here at the end of this little list, I note uh, that yeah, toward the end of Rousseau's life, Louis the Sixth, Louis the Sixteenth uh, takes the throne, and then uh, soon after Rousseau's death, uh, you know, a watershed moment in human history occurs: the the French Revolution, where they, uh, where uh, the ancient regime of Louis the Sixteenth and Louis the Fifteenth, uh, folks that Rousseau lived under, uh, were executed by the people. Um, I think it's really important to keep in mind that uh, Rousseau was living in a world that was marked by deep, deep inequalities and a great deal of cruelty and backbiting, and he was a keen observer of all this, and no doubt this colored you know, the kinds of things that he has to say in, uh, in his works, uh, particularly in the discourse. Uh, in fact, I think one little factoid that um, you know, makes this case is that uh, there's this famous uh, saying uh, uh, attributed to uh, Marie Antoinette, uh, you know, right before the terror. Uh, she says of, you know, all these uh, revolutionary uh, folks that are about to storm the Bastille and so on. Uh, you know, she says, she's, the, the, the story goes that she says something like, let them eat cake. Why can't they eat cake? Why are they so hungry? Can't they just eat cake? Without realizing that uh, cake is actually pretty expensive. Our brioche uh, is, uh, is expensive. Uh, but actually, Marie Antoinette did not say anything like that. But this uh, saying, or, or, there, or at least there's no record that she did. Uh, but this whole thing is ultimately a tri is, is, is something that you can find uh, in, uh, in Rousseau's uh, book, uh, in book six of Rousseau's Confessions, which was written in 1767, far before Marie Antoinette would have been able to say something like this, uh, where he attributed that statement uh, to a princess. But he was making a similar point. This is how out of touch this really rich princess is. Uh, anyway, uh, so anyway, so so Rousseau's you know observing this world, the deep inequalities in this world, and he's commenting on it. Uh, uh, here I have a, a slide. Uh, this is this is where Marie Antoinette uh, and uh, and Louis the Sixteenth. This is where they end up at the guillotine. This is the terror that is kind of a culmination, the response, the the public's response to the ancient regime that Rousseau is living under. Uh, that he, you know, uh, insightfully critiqued and witheringly critiqued. Okay, so uh, another bit of evidence, I mean, like, this is just as obvious as it gets, I think, or as clear of a cut case as it gets, that uh, Rousseau was paying attention to these inequalities and the nature of this uh, fair, uh, cruel regime, is that he writes this uh, work, The Discourse on Inequality. And, and actually, he's writing this... Uh, uh, in response to a call for papers for a prize that was being awarded to whoever could answer this question the best, 
what is the origin of inequality among men and is also authorized by the natural law. So there was this uh, you know, kind of big deal prize competition that Rousseau ultimately wins. Uh, 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 and his discourse on inequality uh, wins this uh, for him. Um, so, so here his motivating question is, what is the origin of inequality among men? And you know this is something that we've actually been uh, studying uh, here in the discourse. Uh, Rousseau speculates a great deal uh, without much uh, m much evidence to back it. We've been reading some things written by contemporary anthropologists uh, and historians uh, who have a lot more evidence and can probably tell a more complete story than Rousseau can. But you'll see there's some very similar broad brushstrokes uh, in what we've read uh, from folks who are more informed than Rousseau could have been. Uh, and Rousseau's, I think, gets at something that uh, these 20th century, our 20, 20th and 21st century folks that we've been reading recently about the origin of inequality, uh, that, that, you know, it, this bit of Rousseau, I think, is going to add to their puzzle. And I'm not going to say that what Rousseau has to say is right, but it's certainly worth considering whether something, the things that he considers, uh, he takes to be key factors in explaining this inequality, uh, whether, I, I think it's worth considering uh, whether you agree. Uh, there, I, to my mind, there is some cogency and plausibility. It's at least worth discussing whether he gets some of these mechanisms right and whether they can add to, say, Gerda Lerner's or Scott's or Bain's story about what's going on with humans and this drive to something like inequality or, or domination. Um, now, one thing that I should take care to do is uh, get clear on what Rousseau's thinking about when he's thinking about inequality. So when he reads this question, what is the origin of inequality among men, uh, he has a particular notion of inequality in mind. He doesn't have physical or natural inequality in mind, meaning differences of age or health or bodily strength and qualities of mind or soul. Rather, he has what he would call moral or political inequality in mind. Uh, and this uh, kind of inequality, it depends for its existence on a kind of convention. Uh, it depends on a kind of a, uh, a convention and it's established or at least, oh, excuse me, uh, or, or at least is authorized by the consent of men. Uh, now, it's worth just pausing here to get clear on what Rousseau means by consent. He doesn't quite mean what we mean by consent, where consent's going to be something like a contract that you and I enter into a contract, there's a promise or a kind of agreement. Uh, uh, for Rousseau, uh, consent is something a little more general than that. And he'll use, there's some ideas, there's a cluster of ideas that are closely related. Um, whenever he uses the term moral, or whenever he uses the term right, uh, he can even use the term law for this, uh, or when he uses the term consent, or, or even convention, these are roughly interchangeable for Rousseau. And what they basically mean is uh, uh, humans interacting in a way where they're following mutually recognized rules. Uh, a good example might be the way, well, before COVID, <laughs> the way uh, greetings would work. Like, you know, there are these mutually recognized rules that two people uh, meeting each other will, will follow uh, where th they'll shake hands. And there's this, there are these you know, these rules of politeness or etiquette about how you conduct a greeting, and people follow them. And these are these are abstract things that you know people have to hold you know keep in mind and follow and guide their behavior with respect to those rules. And there's also something important uh, where everyone mutually recognizes that one another is following the same rule. So so Rousseau packs a whole bunch into this idea of. Of, of the consent of men are moral or right. What he's talking about are these behaviors that we uh, perform guided by these mutually recognized rules. That's kind of a unique, unique thing that humans do, uh, that, that humans do, uh, uh, thinks uh, Rousseau. It's something that we're uniquely capable of to, to act in this consciously se uh, self-aware, rule-governed way. Now, what Rousseau wants to say is like, look, it's by virtue of this rules 
uh, of the, the existence of this rules, these rules, and this way of relating to one another through these rules. It's by virtue of those things that it's possible for there to be inequalities of wealth, property, and income. That it's possible for there to be inequalities in status. Uh, to be a king, a general, or an abbot, or to be inequalities in authority, say, uh, to be a serf and a lord, uh, where one person's the authority, the lord, and the other's the uh, the obeyer, or, you know, is subordinate, uh, the, the serf is subordinate to the lord. The idea is that the, these things, wealth, property, income, uh, the, the, the thing that is a king, general, or abbot, uh, the serfs and lords, those things only exist insofar as we can share a mutually recognized understanding of rules that we're all following. If there weren't rules uh, defining the kingship, there would be no kings. Uh, it's sort of like if there were no rules defining the game of chess, there'd be no kings in chess or queens or pawns or rooks or anything like that in chess. Uh, we, there's a similar idea that, ha that Rousseau has here. It's by virtue of our ability to... Uh, understand, grasp, and follow these mutually accepted and recognized rules, a kind of consent, as it were, that it's possible for us to follow rules that construct hierarchies of various kinds, hierarchies of wealth, hierarchies of kingship uh, and, you know, subjects, hierarchies of uh, serf and lord. It's through those rules that you get inequalities, the kind of inequalities that uh, Rousseau calls moral or political inequalities, and he wants to explain how it came to be that we have uh, moral inequalities. Uh, one thing I should be clear on at the outset is that it would be possible, I suppose, in principle, to have a set of rules that creates perfectly equal relationships amongst persons. Uh, but the, the thing that Rousseau wants to explain is how it is that we came to have rules that actually create uh, stark moral and political inequalities among persons. How does that happen? Okay, now, I one thing I want to uh, note is that I am going to well, Rousseau's. If you've read Rousseau, if you have had a chance to read the discourse on inequality, you'll see it's a very rich and complicated work. Uh, there's a lot going on. This is true of you know all of Rousseau's writings. So of course there are many different interpretations of what exactly uh, he's doing in there. And I just I wanted to uh, just lay down my cards and say the interpretation I'm going to offer you and the one that I feel uh, is uh, highly congenial is one uh, offered by Frederick Neuhauser. Uh, and he's at Columbia University uh, in New York. Uh, he has two books that I recommend to you if you get interested in this stuff. One is Rousseau's The Odyssey of Self-Love, and the other is his uh, book Rousseau on Inequality. I'm going to be speaking a lot about theodicy, and I'm going to explain what a theodicy is uh, for you by the time this lecture is uh, uh, over. But anyway, I am going to forefront uh, uh, of, uh, something that's very close to Newhouser's interpretation of what's going on in the discourse on inequality, and, and even more than that, what's going on in Rousseau's, well, what's going on in Rousseau's work in general, a kind of unifying thread. And the thing that I'm going to forefront with Newhauser, the thing that no Newhauser uh, kind of um, this is the sun of, uh, around which everything in Rousseau orbits, according to Newhauser. Uh, I'm going to forefront uh, Rousseau's discussion of these two drives, and actually, it's one of the drives in particular uh, uh, for humans. Um, the drive in particular that Newhauser sees at the heart of the discourse on inequality, and that uh, Newhauser sees as as unifying much of Rousseau's work, and I'll explain that in a bit, is this drive of a more probe. And to explain this, uh, I think it helps to contrast it, just like uh, Rousseau does, with this other drive that's similar but crucially qualitatively different. Uh, this other drive is a more de soi meme. So let me begin with a more de soi meme. It's the easier one to understand. A more de soi mem is just prudential self-interest, a drive for self-preservation. Here's what Rousseau has to say about it. 
Love of oneself, amor de soi même, is a natural sentiment that moves every animal to be vigilant in its own preservation, and that directed in man by reason and modified by pity produces humanity and virtue. So the idea is that there's this uh, drive, uh, basically, that each of, each of us has to take care of ourselves, uh, respectively. And it's easily tempered uh, by pity for others, but it's just a drive to take care of our interests. Just you know, take care, uh, do what you've got to do to take care of yourself. Okay, now a more probe is more complicated. And a more probe for uh, Rousseau is something that's uniquely human, as we'll see. It calls on humans' distinctive cognitive capacities, and I'll explain that in a bit. But, uh, in, in short, a more probe is this drive for the, uh, for the esteem of another. So let me just quote a passage from Rousseau. By the way, uh, here's one of those cases where in a really important work, some of the main action is going on in a footnote. Both of these passages I'm quoting come from footnote 15 of the Discourse on Inequality. Uh, but anyway, here's Rousseau on a more probe. Uh, the translators use the words egocentrism uh, often uh, for this for a more probe. Sometimes they use a more probe, but in the work, whether if you see a more probe or egocentrism, it's the same thing uh, uh, in this particular translation. So using egocentrism, uh, here's what they have Rousseau saying. Egocentrism is merely a sentiment that is relative, artificial, and born in society that moves each individual to value himself more than anyone else that inspires in men all the evils they cause one another, and is the true source of honor. Okay, let me say a bit more about a more probe. And here's the part uh, that's co cognitively demanding with a more probe. Uh, a more probe is something that only beings who are capable of the highly abstract, cognitively complex, complex operation of seeing oneself from the perspective of another only beings who can do that can have a more probe. Uh, because what a more probe is, is a drive that one has for others to judge one highly in some respect. So it presupposes beings who are capable of imagining that this other being that they're interacting with is forming judgments of them. And then the drive is a drive uh, that those judgments be good judgments. And the, the judgments, the evaluations could, co could come in a number of different forms. One might be judgments of how good you are at something. You know, how good are you at doing, uh, uh, philosophy, writing philosophy lectures and delivering them? How good are you at basketball? How good are you at singing? You know, and on and on and on. Uh, so that's one thing that a more pro can range over. People really want to be acknowledged as good at things. Um, but here, I, but I think uh, Rousseau's mostly concerned with, and certainly in this course, I'm mostly concerned with, the facet of a more probe that wants to be judged as someone whose say about how things are done should count. Or uh, judgments about whether someone's interests count, whether that person's, whether, whether that person matters. Part of a more probe is a demand that one's uh, fellows that are interacting with one uh, uh, judge one to be someone who say counts, whose interests count. It's a drive to be esteemed highly on those dimensions. Now Rousseau thinks this is a fundamental, uh, ineliminable drive for humans. There's no, there's no getting rid of it. Everyone has this drive. Everyone has this drive for esteem. You know, maybe there are some saints or some very special people who are able to, you know, be, uh, let this drive go. But Rousseau's idea is, look, this is a reliable, nearly ineliminable uh, drive for any human person. And the other thing Rousseau is going to, uh, uh, you know, Rousseau clearly believes, if you, you know, read the words of the discourse uh, closely, is that this drive is emotionally powerful, that humans will go to great lengths to satisfy this drive. It really motivates us. And in fact, humans will respond violently to others who refuse to satisfy this demand. And, you know, in kind of contemporary cinema or what have you, I mean, there's this, I think you'll be familiar with an idea like this. 
people who disrespect another oftentimes get responded to uh, in a vengeful way, maybe a murderous way, uh, if you dis uh, depending on the context. All right. So, so here's this. So, so what Rousseau kind of adds to the story that we haven't seen yet from any of these other authors: the story of you know the emergence of domination relationships or the emergence of inequality is this drive. And for Rousseau, or at least as Newhouser interprets Rousseau, this is like the key, the beating heart of uh, Rousseau's philosophy and uh, understanding of human nature. Uh, this drive. Okay, so on this interpretation, on this way of seeing what's going on in the discourse, uh, you can you can look at book one of the discourse as speculating at length uh, of what humans might have been like in a state of nature, and where where the focus is, where the point of doing this is to depict persons as they would be without an activated drive of a more probe. The thing that's distinctive of the people of the people that Rousseau describes in that state is that their more their more probe really hasn't kicked in yet. They, they are not driven by this drive. Uh, one thing to be clear on, uh, I, th uh, Rousseau, I think actually for all of this, for all this sort of history, this account of the mechanism, there's a lot of the details that Rousseau acknowledges are highly speculative, and he's not really committed to the truth of them. I don't think he's really committed to this idea that people in the state of nature were as strong and powerful as he describes them in the discourse. Uh, but I think I think what he's trying to do is give us a kind of cartoon so that we can so that it brings in into vision what humans might have been like in this state, such that uh, this drive a more pro uh, is not activated. Uh, I, I would suspect that uh, Rousseau's considered opinion would be that, uh, well, really, that's not re the way humans ever were. A more probe's always hanging around there. Uh, but the point of this fable, uh, the state of nature, is to just imagine what people would have been like uh, without a more probe, so that he can really clearly show in book two of the discourse about how a more probe is this key explanatory variable uh, that drives uh, the the generation of moral and political inequalities. Uh, anyway, so that's that's the way this particular uh, way of looking at Rousseau. It's a more probe centered way of uh, interpreting Rousseau. This is how this way reads the discourse. The whole point of the discourse ultimately is to show the workings of a more probe and how a more probe drives uh, the generation of these stark moral and political economies, uh, inequalities like those you see in the ancient regime uh, under which, uh, in France under which uh, Rousseau was living. Okay. So here's here's uh, here's a bit of evidence to support that story and uh, and a nice little summary of what Rousseau thinks uh, people were, would be would be like in this state of nature. Uh, to be clear, uh, I'm going to skip over a whole bunch of detail that Rousseau gives us about the way folks were in this uh, fabled state of nature. Uh, but uh, I want to focus, you know, high, and I want to just focus and highlight instead on these key outlines of the story, those that revolve around the more probe. And here's a bit of that. Here's a kind of summation of what he thinks of, of people in this fabled state of nature. He says, man's first sentiment was that of his own existence. His first concern was that of his preservation. The products of the earth provided him with all the help he needed. Instinct led him to make use of them, with hunger and appet other appetites making him experience by turns various ways of existing. There is one appetite that invited him to perpetuate his species. And this blind inclination, devoid of any sentiment of the heart, produces a purely animal act. So here, what Rousseau is describing is people in the state of nature who are driven exclusively by amour de soi même, their self-preservation, these basic appetites, these, this basic self-interest, uh, you know, to live and reproduce, uh, you know, the desires and the drives that kind of make up that part of persons, amour de soi même, very, very simple persons. Uh, not not complicated by this other drive, a more probe. Okay, now here's why I've 
Now he contrasts this later. This is this is you know uh, uh, about another third uh, of the way through the book. Uh, he contrasts, uh, or he describes to us what life under a more pro looks like, and that stands in marked contrast to his characterization of life uh, for people mainly governed by a more as well known. So here's people in the first sentence, he's talking about people living under a uh, mortis while men. Savage man breathes only tranquility and liberty. He wants simply to live and rest easy. That's a life pursuing a, a mortis while men, satisfying your basic needs, then getting le uh, leisure after that, uh, once you've done that, and then you're calm, then you're done. You're not, you're not moved to do anything else. But, but that's not the way humans really are. Uh, that's not the way humans are, in, uh, at least uh, uh, governed under a more probe as they are. So he says, on the other hand, the citizen, meaning the person who's not in the state of nature anymore, they're now living in a civil condition. On the other hand, the citizen is always active and in a sweat, always agitated and unceasingly tormenting himself in order to seek still more labori laborious occupations. He works until he dies. He even runs to his death in order to be in a position to live or renounces life in order to acquire uh, immortality. He pays court to the great whom he hates and to the rich whom he scores. He stops at nothing to obtain the honor of serving them. He proudly crows about his own baseness and their protection, and proud of his slavery, he speaks with disdain about those who do not have the honor of taking part of it. Okay, so what's going on here? So here's, uh, I think, Rousseau's deep point. If you were this person in the fabled state of nature who only was driven by a more probe. The, all you would do is satisfy those basic needs that a more probe sets for you. A more probe is these prudential concerns with reproduction and you know satisfying your basic appetites like eating and uh, not being hungry and uh, rest and maybe play, you know, things like this. That's all you do. And those appetites are easily sated. I, you know, you, you just, you eat your fill and then you're done. You, uh, you know, you find a mate and you reproduce and then you're done. Uh, you, you know, play a few games with someone and you're done. And, and it's, it's this kind of easy, stable state. These, this is a, a mortis wall mem can be satiated and it has, it's, it's, it has a kind of finitude toward it, uh, to it. It has a, uh, it has an end. Uh, that's not the way a more probe is like. Because the more probe what you're wanting is others to esteem you. And that is a precarious uh, state because that esteem uh, can, you, you can't, you, you can't control it. It may or may not be there. But more than that, you, there's always more to be had. There's many, many dimensions along which you, uh, to seek this esteem. And there's many, many ways in which it can be taken from you. Uh, it's a much more precarious and in some ways a much more a much more capacious maybe even an uh, 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 an infinite uh, an unfillable uh, 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 drive an insatiable drive uh, so the idea then is that if you're driven by this drive uh, at least a particular version of it as well, as I hope to make clear uh, you're going to be always agitated never able to fully satisfy it always living in uh, in the opinion of others, always ha having your satisfaction of this basic need for a more probe uh, turn on, the precarious uh, response, the, 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 the response out of your control uh, of others. One feature that I should uh, point out uh, as well is that a more probe uh, can be a kind of a, a zero-sum game. I think this is part of what makes for such the agitated state that uh, Rousseau describes. Uh, so think of a world where what everyone wants is to have uh, to be esteemed as a superior to others. Now, in a world like that, uh, we have a kind of zero-sum some thing going on here where my uh, my greater esteem is your lower esteem. For me to get what I want, you have to be denied what you want. And so that puts the folks that are living 
uh, under this drive, this shared drive of uh, a more appropriate looking for greater esteem from others. It puts, it pits people in a kind of conflict. I must pull you down to pull myself up. Uh, it puts me in a situation where uh, I will uh, go after you in order uh, and, and betray you and be cruel to you if necessary to pull myself up and to pull you down. Uh, this is part of the picture. We, uh, folks who are driven by this kind of a more probe where you want to be ex acknowledged as a superior, that uh, is a agitated, scary sort of world. And I think this is a world that Rousseau would purport to observe, say, in the court of Versailles, right before, you know, 20 or 30 years before uh, folks got so fed up with what was going on there, all the cruelty and backbiting and uh, inequalities this was generating, uh, to, you know, overthrow it all and, and kill a bunch of those folks. Uh, it was a world like this, with a more broke sort of run amok, that I think Rousseau uh, uh, felt himself to be observing. Okay. Now, let me just... Uh, to, I think, nail down this point, let me quote one more passage from Rousseau, where he brings in a more probe, uh, you know, where it's clear that he's thinking of his a more probe as kind of the key, uh, the key to this difference between how life is under in the state of nature under a mortis wall mem, as opposed to life uh, in the civil condition where a more probe is, is really taking off. So here he says, the true cause of all these differences the savage lives in, in himself. The man accustomed to the ways of society is always outside himself and knows how to live only in the opinion of others. And it is, as it were, from their judgment alone that he draws the sentiment of his own existence. It is not pertinent to my subject to show how, from such a disposition, so much indifference toward good and evil arises, along with such fine discourse on morality, how with everything reduced to appearances, everything becomes factitious and bogus, honor, friendship, virtue, and often even our vices, about which we eventually find the secret of boasting. How, in a word, we who are always asking others what we are and never daring to question ourselves on this matter, who in the midst of uh, so much philosophy, humanity, politeness, and so many sublime maxims, we have merely a deceitful and frivolous exterior, honor without virtue, reason without wisdom, and pleasure without happiness. Now, I want to help you understand that passage a bit. The way I see it, what's key for Rousseau here is um, get, let's get really clear on what a more probes would drive for. A more probes would drive for the esteem of others. And so you'll do all kinds of things to get that esteem, but uh, it, you don't really care if you've done something substantial that's good in itself so long as you get the esteem from others. So you might pretend toward morality. Uh, so that you're acknowledged for being moral, get that kind of high esteem. But what you really want when a moral parope is out of control is you want the esteem, and you don't care if you really do the thing that uh, it, it elicits the esteem. So you, you will uh, pretend to honor. You'll pretend to, ver to, to be a friend. You'll uh, pretend to all these things uh, in order to get that good opinion of others, in order to secure uh, the the judgment of others. Uh, okay. All right. So now here, kind of sticking at this sort of bird's eye uh, march through the discourse of inequality, let me describe, I think, a, a, a key kind of movement uh, in the discourse. And this movement from part one to part two, and then what part two culminates in. And this is a movement that I'm going to call the transition to the civil condition, the transition from the state of nature to the civil condition. And I'm going to break that into three different parts. Uh, one is this part where Rousseau establishes this idea of economic interdependence. This is a key uh, cog in the mechanism that moves us to the civil condition. Uh, there's this struggle and moral conflict that happens uh, in this uh, community of folks who are living in this economically independent way. And then there's the introduction of this false social contract that he describes in this, uh, that, 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 that brings the civil condition into being. And here we're going to see that this false social contract gives us a whole bunch of things where this uh, 
a muck version, a more pro can go to work uh, and drive people to try to uh, arrogate to themselves or bring to themselves uh, the, the all the good stuff, all the surplus that this false social contract generates. Okay, so let me just let me just start with economic independence. It's going to be a very quick account. So in the discourse, uh, you know, the discourse is full of fables. Uh, we have the fable of what it's like to live in the state of nature without a more pro. We also have this fable of how uh, the ways of producing goods just changes. Uh, Rousseau doesn't really give an explanation, but he says, look, something like this happens at some point. At some point, people start living off the off the resources and you know uh, obtaining their goods for survival and uh, and such uh, through different means that uh, they move from sort of living out in the wild and just living off the land to working together in larger cooperative units with uh, divisions of labor where the different parts of the producing unit uh, are interdependent they rely on one another so there's this fable of metallurgists, that's basically like blacksmiths, people who work with metal, and agriculturalists, that's, that's the people who work out there in the farms and the fields. Uh, these folks work together to do something like the plow agriculture that you know I was discussing uh, from Scott last time. Uh, but they, they both need each other. Like the metallurgists can't survive without the agriculturalists. Uh, because the metallurgists need the agriculturalists to produce all the food, but the agriculturalists can't produce the food uh, without the the metals that make the plows that allow the agriculturalists to uh, till those fields. Uh, so there's the, so these groups of folks are there. This is relatively large groups of folks that are locked together in these uh, conditions of economic interdependence. Nobody can go live self sufficiently. So they can't do what the folks in Rousseau's fabled state of nature did, which is they kind of live like tigers on the Siberian steppes as little isolated units uh, who could easily run away from each other and didn't need one another for anything other than uh, reproduction occasionally. Uh, the, the, by contrast with those folks, folks who are producing their means of subsistence uh, and, and the way that Rousseau is describing here, they're locked in these conditions of interdependence because no one can really be self-sufficient in that way. Um, this, this echo, or not echo, this, uh, this, is, this is echoed by the observation that we've seen from our various authors in the last few weeks about how hunter-gatherers were these relatively self-sufficient smaller bands of folks uh, and then there was at some point a movement to these much larger groups of persons who had to live, who, who were economically interdependent. Like no one could really survive on their own uh, once you moved to this different form of, uh, uh, of an economy. Uh, you know, one like kind of cheeky way to put it, using Scott's maybe way of thinking about this, we domesticated humans cannot live outside these interdependent forms of economy. We're not like Rousseau's fabled savages uh, who can just live like tigers in the woods. Okay, so 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 now why is this a big deal for Rousseau? Why is this transition a big deal for Rousseau? Uh, here's, I think, a piece that Rousseau adds uh, uh, to these past accounts that we've seen. Uh, the idea is that when folks are stuck together in these interdependent relationships, they can't help but live in community with one another. And that gives, that, that's fertile ground. That's like the conditions that uh, enable our late and more probe to take off. Because if we can't just run away from one another, we're going to sit and we're stuck with one another, and then we're going to start... Then our drive for more probes is going to kick in because we're going to start making comparisons. And if we're living with these folks, uh, given this feature of our human nature, we're going to want to be esteemed by these folks that we're stuck with, as uh, uh, you know, to, to a certain degree. You know, we, we are going to want the good judgment of that one. We're going to start living in their minds. We're, we're going to take our worth as derivative of of uh, what they think of us. Uh, so, so the idea, what's important about economic interdependence is it holds us together and, and holds us there so that the, 
so that this weight and drive of a more, of a more probe can take off. Because uh, if we can't get away from one another, we're going to well, you know, start doing this thing that we as humans can do. We'll just start seeing uh, ourselves from the perspective of all these people that we're stuck with, and we're going to demand that they esteem us high, highly from their perspective. Uh, more probes are really going to get going. Okay, so uh, in Rousseau's fable, uh, uh, which, you know, interestingly, isn't like, a, even though it's probably, it's wrong in a lot of particulars, doesn't look too far off from some of the informed anthropological stuff. Uh, so in, in this fable, in Rousseau's fable, you know, we went from a condition of relative self-sufficiency to interdependence, economic interdependence, with much larger communities of folks. Uh, in these in these large economically interdependent units where we're all producing a surplus together, there are going to be these questions. There are going to be these questions about what to do with the surplus, for one, how to divide the fruits of this cooperative labor. There's going to be questions about who gets to decide, who has the authority to decide how those divisions, those divisions get made. And there's going to be these questions uh, about who controls the key productive assets, who controls the farms, who controls the oxen, who controls, well, uh, the uh, other people in the sense that uh, who gets to order them around, uh, who, who controls all this stuff. There's going to be a struggle, uh, 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 thanks for so, uh, about these questions. And most particularly, there's going to be a struggle between folks that are dispossessed in these communities who get less or maybe even get boxed out of this production and those who, you know, uh, and the wealthy who, who start climbing the apex of this economically interdependent form of production. And uh, one of Rousseau's big points is a more probe is going to fuel this because a more probe is going to make, it makes for people who aren't content with just getting what they need. Uh, it's going to, a more probe makes for people who want to be at the top of the apex, who want to get more than other people, uh, and want to control others, uh, because these are ways, by, by having more than others, by controlling others, by being acknowledged as entitled to more, by being acknowledged as someone who gets to control others, that's how you get your more probe satisfied. Uh, you get this, uh, you, uh, uh, yeah. So the idea is that if it weren't for this drive for a more probe, people wouldn't really care to be at the top so long as they were just getting their more to swam men satisfied. But Rousseau's point is people aren't like that. If they're living in community with one another, there's this natural drive to want to be esteemed highly by the others, and that manifests that itself in this uh, as a as a demand. To be acknowledged as uh, to be to be esteemed highly in the form of being given more, having more control, having more of a say. So for Rousseau, a more probe makes all the difference. Uh, for Rousseau, if we were beings that only were driven by more to swap mem, economic interdependence would not lead to these kind of inequalities, because we would just be content with having enough to basically get by. But we're not like that. We're driven to be acknowledged as superior, which means we're going to be uh, 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 this drive for more probe is going to generate uh, these stark inequalities. Uh, so, but anyway, a more probe is going to fuel the struggle. Struggle. It's going to fuel the struggle uh, for who's going to get esteemed in this way, uh, and who's going to get more of the surplus and have control of the surplus. And it, this struggle is going to come with a lot of bloodshed and a lot of cruelty and a lot of strife and unrest. And so Rousseau's idea is that uh, some of the more clever folks who are making their way to the top of this social hierarchy come up with, a, come up with an idea, a kind of a, a revolution, uh, well, no, the opposite of a revolution, I suppose. Uh, maybe a technological re revolution of a sort, uh, a social technology, uh, revolution of social technology. For Rousseau, he says, look, 
uh, some really clever elites um, get this great idea to basically con the people. And so on page 79, he says, hey, here's what he says that the elites say uh, to the others. And others like just go for it because they're tired of the struggle. And they're trying to find a way to avoid this struggle that's happening in these new economic interdependent communities. They say, let us unite in order to protect the weak from oppression, restrain the ambitious, and ensure everyone of possessing what belongs to him. Let us institute rules of justice and peace to which all will be obliged to conform, which will make special exceptions for no one and which will in some way compensate from the caprices of fortune by subjecting the strong and the weak to mutual obligations. In short, instead of turning our forces against ourselves, let us gather them into one supreme power that governs us according to wise laws, that protects and defends all the members of the association, repulses common enemies, and maintains us in an eternal concord. Um, so that's the sales job, but it's a false contract because all those fancy words, all those high-flowing words are not honored in the deed. Uh, they're, they're the promise. But uh, the, what Rousseau's idea is folks basically agree to some arrangement like this, but immediately what happens is the folks that are able, under these new terms, under this false contract, who've been empowered in these various ways by the, uh, the contracts, uh, empowered by these new rules that are accepted, they use that power, given they're a more pro bono muck, to just keep acquiring more and more for themselves to satisfy this drive to be seen, esteemed. Okay, so on this contract, just let me point out, this contract creates the stuff that makes up moral inequality. This contract it, uh, makes up the various rules uh, the widely accepted and followed rules, the laws and conventions of our society. You know, a key subset of those rules are rules that create authority relationships that allow those in authority to massively project their power. Uh, you know, if you get a boss, then the boss can t is authorized to tell everyone else how to act. Everyone reliably follows them. Now that boss is much more powerful than that boss could have ever been just as a single physical human being. There are also rules, and it's, and it's rules. It's a whole set of conventions or mutually acknowledged rules in this, uh, that are the terms of the social contract that creates bosses, that creates authority structures, and massively projects the powers of individuals at the, top, so at the, at the apex of those authority structures. These rules also set up uh, property relationships and units of owned wealth. You know, before that, there's just stuff that you might be able to physically control if you're strong enough. But once these rules are accepted, this social contract is accepted, everyone, the, those, those parts of those rules say who gets what, under what conditions. Uh, uh, so the rules kind of create this possibility, this unit that can become an object for a more probe to play with. Because now people are going to desire more of that stuff, of more of whatever stuff there is available that's defined and you know identified by these rules. They're going to want more of it to manifest to, to, as a kind of embodiment of the esteem that others give uh, to them. Uh, and then there's going to be rules that set out differences in status, you know, rules that are going to uh, define priests and abbots and earls and kings and uh, lower statuses like lords, and, uh, like serfs and such. The, the social contracts made of all these rules and a more probe is going to lead people insofar as they can do so push for rules that define inequalities between persons along all these dimensions. All right. So there's the basic story for Rousseau, uh, uh, where a more probe plays this key role in generating uh, inequalities in conditions of economic interdependence. Now, with all that, you might think that Rousseau would say, man, the best thing for humans would be to go back to the state of nature uh, and live without a more probe. Uh, but I don't think that's right. And uh, I don't think that's the right interpretation of Rousseau anyway. Uh, I think something that's just, sometimes it's kind of easy to mess with Rousseau, is Rousseau is, uh, his work is a, something you might call a theodicy. 
remember Neuhauser's book is called uh, uh, Rousseau's Theodicy of Self-Love. Well, what's a theodicy? Well, the origins, you know, the, the main way this word is used, theodicy, is to explain uh, why there's evil in the world. And the, the structure of this kind of explanation is uh, that there's evil in the world because the thing that drives that evil is also the thing that's an absolute necessary condition of there being good. Uh, so you might think of, well, why is there evil in the world? This is, you know, a, a, I think a, a, a way that many uh, religious uh, traditions think of it. Well, there's evil in the world because uh, for, in order for there to be good in the world, uh, humans have to have free will. But if they have free will, then there's the possibility that they're going to act on that free will to act in an evil way. That's a kind of theodicy. And you point to something that's a common cause of the good in the world and the evil in the world. And, uh, and you, you explain, like, and that's a kind of way of explaining uh, why, uh, why you have to have the evil and why that is a necessary complement of having good. Rousseau, I think, thinks of a more prope in this way. A more prope is, plays this kind of common cause kind of role. And let me explain that in the rest of the lecture. So, so, so let me begin with this little, with, with a little passage that I read earlier. And I'm going to read it again, highlighting the very end of the passage. So here's the first part. The, the first part looks like, yeah, uh, Rousseau wants to get rid of a more prope. A, you know, and which would go with the idea that it'd be great if we live in the state of nature without a more probe. He says, egocentrism, that's a more probe, is merely a sentiment that is relative, artificial, and born in society, that moves each individual to value himself more than anyone else, that inspires in all men all the evils they cause one another. Okay, all right, well, we should go back to the state of nature then. But then, the telecized part, and that is the true source of honor. Wait a second, <laughs> that that doesn't fit with the rest of the sentence. Now all, all of a sudden, the more pro egocentrism, this thing that's relative, artificial, and uh, inspires in men all the evils, it's also the true source of honor. Hmm, puzzle. Here's another passage. This is in footnote ten uh, from the discourse, and he's you know considering this question. Like, look. If the civil condition is what gets a more probe going and creates all this bad stuff, well, wouldn't it be better to go back to the state of nature? So Rousseau says, what then? Must we destroy societies, annihilate thine and mine, and return to live in the forests with bears? And then he says, well, actually, no. He says, as for men like me, whose passions have forever destroyed their original simplicity, who can no longer feed on grass and acorns, nor get by without laws and chiefs, those who were honored in their first father with supernatural lessons, those who will see in the intention of giving human actions from the beginning a morality they would not have acquired for a long time, the reason for a precept indifferent in itself and inexplicable in any other system, those in a word who are convinced that the divine voice called the entire human race to the enlightenment and the happiness of the celestial intelligences. All those latter ones will attempt, through the exercise of virtues, they oblige themselves to practice while learning to know them, to merit the eternal reward that they ought to expect for them. Okay, so what's going on here? So here, I think Rousseau is saying, like, look, it's in the state of nature, you, uh, you cannot answer this divine voice that calls you, as a member of the human race, to enlightenment and happiness uh, shared by celestial intelligences. So there is a, somehow, uh, Rousseau thinks there's a better way of life uh, available in the civil condition that's not available in the state of nature. Uh, and so there's something worth getting that you can only get in the civil condition through the, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, through the civil condition that you can't get in the state of nature. And that makes the civil condition in a sense, worth the risks of all this cruelty that he sees in it. Let's say a bit more. Let me try to flesh out the story a bit further for you and tie it back to a more probe. 
let me fast forward to what we're gonna to some stuff we're gonna look at next time. This, I'm gonna fast forward to a, a couple of passages from the social contract, and this is really key for Rousseau. Uh, and this is where Rousseau con, uh, just contrasts the kind of freedom that you can have in the in the state of nature from the freedom that you can have in the civil condition. Uh, so he talks about entering into a social contract in the social contract and in the, in the social contract this is supposed to be a true social contract unlike the false one that he describes in the civil uh, in the in the state of in in the discourse the true social contract actually does the things it delivers on the goods that the elites try to sell in the discourse what you can get under the social contract in this civil condition thinks rousseau is you can get Civil liberty, as opposed to the natural liberty uh, that you ha that you have in the uh, state of nature, his idea is you exchange your natural liberty for the civil liberty, and civil liberty is better. Um, and the reason why uh, Rousseau points to in the second uh, passage that I quote, the acquisition in the civil state of moral liberty, which which alone makes man truly the master of himself. For to be driven by appetite alone is slavery, and obedience to the law one has prescribed for oneself is liberty. Okay, now I'm hoping next week this will get clearer, but let me take a first pass at it here. So Rousseau's idea is that in the state of nature, uh, when one is a being that's fully governed by a mortis well mem and follows one's appetites and goes for them, you're in this state of natural liberty. But, in, but he also says that you're, he has this idea that you're enslaved by those appetites. You're not truly free. You're just driven by those appetites. And his idea is that under the social contract, you can live in a higher state, something that's more like the state that the celestial intelligences live in. That is, you can uh, come up with these moral uh, guides, these moral maxims, uh, that are enshrined in the law, that are enshrined in the social contract, and you can make those your guide, and you follow those, and you follow those, these laws that you've prescribed for oneself in this social contract, then you are truly free. Or you are, you, you are enjoying a qualitatively different and better kind of freedom than this, uh, this simple kind of freedom that you get when driven by your, directly by your passions. So I think Rousseau's idea is that something really important happens in the civil condition. Uh, we're able to live under this law that we legislate for them ourselves, which makes us truly free and something that's akin to the divine, and that's a better way of being. Um, now, where does this fit? How does a more probe fit into all of this? I th for Rousseau, Rousseau wants to distinguish, I think, between uh, a very problematic kind of amour propre and a good kind of amour propre. Rousseau's idea is that in humans, amour propre is kind of a malleable tribe. It's, you can't get rid of it. You've got it, but it's, it can be shaped in different ways. And the problematic way that a amour propre can get shaped is what uh, Neuhauser, calls inflamed amour propre. Uh, 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 Rousseau never uses this term inflamed amour propre, but you can see in uh, the pages of his work this distinction that uh, Newhouser brings to the surface. Inflamed amour propre is in a demand for being esteemed as a superior. Uh, particularly, it's a demand that one's interest and one's say be recognized as counting for more than others. Recognizes counting for more in the form of the special high authority that you're given over others, or the greater amount of wealth you're entitled to, the greater status uh, as someone who, before whom most people need to bend and scrape and bow. Uh, inflamed a more probe wants those kinds of things because it want it's demanding this esteem as a superior along these dimensions. Uh, that's very different from uh, a more probe to just be recognized as like the best football player. This is something that's deeper and more fundamental. This is a uh, desire to just be recognized as having interests that count for more, or to having a say that should count for more. 
Now you can contrast that with what we might call tamed or egalitarian amor propria. And this is a demand for being esteemed as an equal, particularly a demand that one's interest and one's say is recognized as counting the same as everyone else's in the community. Now, just notice uh, uh, the, the big difference between a community regulated by inflamed amor propria or one regulated, uh, you know, driven uh, in general by folks who have egalitarian amor propria. A community where everyone's looking for inflamed amor propria, that's going to be a, a community of struggle and that's, that, that, that is incapable of being, where, where the, this drive is, is a drive that cannot be satisfied for everyone and that's going to continually you know, drive uh, cruelty and instability and backbiting in the society because everyone's going to be constantly <laughs> churning, trying to get on top of this ladder of esteem. But by contrast, I think uh, Rousseau's idea is that egalitarian amor propre can create for a mutually satisfiable uh, equilibrium. Like everyone can get, everyone in a community can have a more probe channeled or shaped in this way satisfied. Uh, so, the, so, so his idea is that it's really important that a more probe is malleable, and the hope for humanity is that that it, that it can that we can successfully channel a more probe into this tamer egalitarian form. And his idea is that the true social contract facilitates and in, embodies. In the tamed version of a more probe, uh, and and here now I think we can see how it all hangs together. The true social contract is one in which people live under a set of rules that uh, acknowledge, or embody, or reflect the equality of interest and the equality of say of everybody. And here for Rousseau, this true so social contract and this tamed a more probe. Uh, are going to be the font of morality, mer virtue, and moral freedom. To live under laws that create these relations of equal recognitions of one's, one another's say and interests, that's to live uh, in this way that reflects or is continuous with the celestial or the divine intelligence. Uh, that's the way to live uh, a moral life. Uh, and it's only possible to do that in a community of laws and economic interdependence uh, and under rules that reflect this equality of persons. Tamed and more probe makes for a better kind of human than humans outside the civil condition. This is what virtue and goodness consists of, is living in accordance with of laws, mutually recognized rules that accord uh, equal say and uh, an equal esteem to one another's interests. Uh, so on this account, I think the way Rousseau is going to think about it is savages aren't evil, but they're not virtuous either, because being virtuous to, is to live under rules that reflect the equality of your say with everyone else's and the equality of your interest with everyone else's. It's only the citizen living under a true con contract that can be fully free to be governed by these rules that reflect this mutual equality. Uh, the, only these citizens can be fully free, virtuous, truly moral. That's the theodicy for Rousseau. You need a more probe to be able to get virtue. A more probe creates virtue. It's the possibility of virtue. Unfortunately, a more probe is also the thing, if it's channeled the wrong way, if it's developed in the wrong way, it's going to create the greatest viciousness and cruelty, the kind that you see uh, in these ancient grain states uh, or in the ancient regime uh, uh, of Louis the, uh, the 15th and 16th, uh, under whom Rousseau lived. Okay, so now uh, just kind of situate this interpretation of Rousseau, like what's going on with Rousseau. There, you can you can see a unifying thread in all of Rousseau's work through this lens, like thinking of Rousseau as being concerned with a more probe and channeling it in the right way. Uh, one of his books, Emile, he has many many books, more than these three, but one of his books, Emile, is an extended treatise on the moral education of a child. And a large part of that book in moral education is about helping Emil tame his amor pro, uh, to, to, to come out with uh, an Emil who has egalitarian amor pro as opposed to one who's driven by a desire to be esteemed as a superior uh, in these problematic ways. 
The discourse on inequality explains the more broke and its key role in human history, the generation of vice, evil, and inequality, as well as, and it also hints that uh, a more probe might be the font of morality and virtue as well. Uh, then finally, the social contract uh, is, this is really continuous, and this is the next work we're going to read in the course, the social contract is really continuous with the themes of this course, because the social contract is, as we'll see, it's a project in institutional design. Meant, uh, meant to give us institutions, you know, suggest sorts of institutions under a social contract that will help us tame a more pro and live with one another virtuously and in a state of moral equality as opposed to this state of moral inequality that uh, Rousseau described uh, in the discourse. Uh, with that, I thank you and I will be talking to you uh, next